Welcome to Club Book featuring Nancy Pearl. My name is Stacy Hendren and I'm the branch manager of the Northtown Library in the Anoka County Library System in Blaine, Minnesota. Anoka County Library has the honor of co-hosting this evening's guest. Before I introduce Nancy properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit more about the unique series that is bringing her to you. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency made possible through Minnesota's Art and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Club Book has been part of the Twin Cities literary landscape in some form for decades now, for a decade now, but they've never brought you a season quite like this. Thanks for making the pivot to Facebook Live with us. Thanks also to partnering bookseller Red Balloon Bookshop, a purchase link to the Writer's Library, which I cannot recommend highly enough, will be available in the comments section of this live feed stream. Have it shipped, pick it up at their lovely St. Paul location, or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're in the area. After you purchase a book, email Nancy and she will send you a personalized signed book plate. Nancy's email will also be in the comments. I enjoyed reading the Writer's Library cover to cover, but no, I will go back to it over and over to get to know the authors whose books I am reading and to choose what I should read next. So I will be ordering a book and a book plate as well. One final housekeeping note. Also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melsa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program, particularly in light of the necessary changes to format this fall. It's quick and easy. Without further ado, Nancy Pearl is America's librarian. As the head of the Washington Center for the Book, she pioneered the groundbreaking If All Seattle Read the Same Book series in the late 1990s. The Library of Congress now estimates that upwards of 400 communities, community read programs take place every year, and each owes a debt to Pearl's replicable templates. Nancy Pearl is also an acknowledged expert in reader's advisory, both within librarianship and outside of the field. Her best-selling multi-installment book lust series is a testament to her uncanny ability to recommend a book for every mood, moment, and reason. Library Journal named Pearl the Librarian of the Year in 2011. In a still more singular honor, she's also the inspiration and image behind the popular librarian action figure from Archie McPhee. Pearl's newest release, The Writer's Library, is an edited anthology showcasing how favorite books altered the lives of 23 chart-topping authors, including luminaries like Dave Eggers, Luis Alberto Urea, Amor Tolls, and Minnesota's own Louise Erdrich. After Nancy speaks about the anthology and the stories behind the stories, I will come back into frame and ask her some burning questions. If you have any questions of your own for Nancy, drop them into the comments feed. Our time together is limited, but we'll get to what we can. Nancy, take it away. Thank you, Stacy. It's so nice to be here. Um, I just wanted to start by uh, just telling you a little tiny bit about how the book came to be, how Jeff Schwager and I wrote, uh, decided to do this book and um, how we chose the authors who are part of it, the 23 writers. Um, I, I met Jeff Schwager um, when he was curating a, doing a freelance job curating an exhibit for the Washington State Jewish Historical Society. And they were giving, um, recognizing 20 Jewish women in the state of Washington uh, for their contributions. And I was um, honored to be one of them. And Jeff interviewed all of the 20 of us uh, individually. And when he and I started talking, it was, 
um, it was like I was talking to somebody in my own family. It was like we just were so comfortable and we immediately got off on the subject of books we loved and books we didn't love. And we're really interested to find out that we shared um, a love of certain authors and we differed greatly on other authors. And Jeff is uh, much younger than I am. He's like a very little brother to me. And you know, when you meet somebody who loves the books that that you love, you really, you really, you want to talk about those books. Um, you want to talk to that person and find out maybe what books they've loved that you've never even heard of. So Jeff and I would get together periodically and talk about what we were reading and um, and and what was happening in the world and all of those things. And one day Jeff said, you know, for a long time I've had this title in my mind, the writer's library. Um, and he said, I have this idea that of going into writer's homes and just doing these beautiful photographs of their physical libraries. Now I have to say here, uh, that Jeff is incurably nosy and he loves to do that kind of thing. Um, so he said, and then it would be, we'd do a little interview and it would be a coffee table book. And, and I said, well, you know, Jeff, coffee table books are not, um, I'm not interested in coffee table books. I don't have the kind of life where coffee table books play an important part. But I would be interested in doing a series of, of interviews um if there if that was possible and he and then we talked to my agent victoria sanders and i said you know what do you think about these two ideas and she said nancy a coffee table book is not your brand but interviews with writers about the books they love is so go with that and that really set us on this um this wonderful journey by mostly by plane and car to interview these 23 authors um and there are so there are 23 authors that we interviewed and there are 22 interviews and the reason for that um difference is that we interviewed michael shaban and his wife ayella waldman together and um, in their home in Berkeley and uh, at their dining room kitchen slash dining room table. Um, and it's, it's many people have commented that that's one of the most entertaining um, interviews in the book. But to choose who we were going to interview, Jeff and I each made a list of the authors that we just really felt were just so important and we couldn't bear to leave out of the book. And the ones that were overlaps, um, of course, those were on our final list of people that we wanted to ask. Now, you know, there, that, that if you think of it as a Venn diagram, that overlapping group of books, gr group of authors was, was you know, was a, it was fine. It was a nice size, but there were plenty of authors that Jeff loved that I didn't and that I loved that he didn't. Um, and so I won't say that fisticuffs ensued, but I, I do say, I will say that we had a lot of, um, strong conversations about, uh, lively conversations about the authors that we wanted to include. And then of course, some of the authors that we wanted to include didn't, weren't able to, to do it um, because of various time pressures or you know, other, other reasons they were working on a new book, whatever. But the authors that we ended up with, the 23 writers that we ended up with, I think give just a wonderful, very diverse picture of where contemporary American uh, literature is. And um, it was great fun to do the interviews. And um, I, there was a lot of laughter. Even when you read the book, I think you can get a feeling for how much we all enjoyed those, um, enjoyed doing the interviews. As I said earlier, we, we or interviewed most of the writers, uh, the majority of the writers at their homes. And um, when we didn't, we, when we weren't able to do that, we interviewed writers in places that were important to them. So we interviewed Louise Erdrich at her, at Birchbark Books. Um, and we interviewed Vendela Vida, at um, a bookstore near her home in San Francisco. Let's see, who else did we not interview? Oh, we interviewed Luis Urea 
um, on his way home, but in a hotel in Portland, Oregon. So, um, you know, there were some of those, but mostly we interviewed the authors in their homes and we did see their book collections and we were able to um, walk around and look at the books they had and talk about those books. So it was really great. So I think I'm going to let you, Stacy, um, uh, start asking questions because it's always interesting to me to see what I've left out of that talk. Wonderful. So I would like to start the question portion by asking you a few questions that you asked the authors in the book. So would you please tell us about yourself as a young reader? So let me just say that um, that when we were interviewing these authors, we did not have a, a set list of questions. I think that's one of the things that makes the book so interesting and so exciting because every interview is different. We would start out each interview with that question. You know, I would usually say, were you a big reader as a child or did you come from a reading family or something like that? But after that, we would let the interviewee, the writer, really, really take the interview wherever he or she wanted it to be. So um, my experience as a reader, as a child and a reader, is that um, reading was for me the most important thing in my life. And um, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, so I'm a upper Midwest kind of gal. And um, I grew up in a family where uh, that would now probably be called what I knew was that it was just really not a safe place to be. And so I spent all my time at my local public library, which was the Parkman Branch Library, and I know uh, the part of the Detroit Public Library system. And I was one of those kids that, you know, in many ways are the despair of librarians because I would get to the library at nine o'clock on Saturdays, and I would still be there at 5.30 on Saturdays when the library closed. I would go every day after school. Um, the first crushes on boys that I had were all the pages, the shelvers, you know, because those are the people I saw the most. And it was a librarian, it was a children's librarian at that library, Miss, Miss Whitehead, Miss Frances Whitehead, who really, um, you know, I like to say that she took this really miserably unhappy child that I was and gave me the world. She, she just, um, she opened up books for me. She, she made, she, she allowed me to see that there were other ways of being. There were other ways of living. There were other, it, it, you know, when she met me, I was about eight. And all I read when I was eight were horse and dog books, like many urban eight-year-old girls, I think. And, um, and really, if we went to the Parkman Library today, Stacy, if I took you there, I could go to the shelves where those do horse and dog books used to be, the fiction, because they pulled them out of the fiction collection and had their own section, which was very nice for people like me. But Miss, so Miss Whitehead would say, she would come up to me, and she would say, Nancy, we just got in the new Marguerite Henry horse book. Would you like to be the very first person to read this book? The very first person in the library to check out this book? Well, I mean, who would not want that? I, it was like, and so, and I have to say, this is the first example of bait and switch that, I've, that I was introduced to because I would hold out my hand. I'd say, oh yes, I would hold out my hand for that book that Miss Whitehead was, was holding. And she would say, oh, but wait, before I give you this, I just want you to read another book, another book called The Wind in the Willows or The Hobbit or Mary Poppins. Miss Whitehead was Canadian, so she, she really gave me a good diet of British children's fiction, um, which I'm very grateful for because I grew up to be such a bibliophile, uh, such a, um, an Anglophile and a bibliophile. So reading, you know, uh, Miss Whitehead was so wonderful and so important in my childhood that that's why I became a librarian. I, I when I was, yeah, when I was 10 years old, I knew, I, I mean, I knew that I was going to be a children's librarian. I, I wanted to do, you know, as one of those kids who wanted to make the world a better place. And I wanted to do for other children what Miss Whitehead did for me, to, to give them the world. Um, 
and I did. I mean, I grew up and went to, you know, graduated from the University of Michigan, went immediately to library school at the University of Michigan, and then went back. And my first job was at the Detroit Public Library System. So I wasn't at my library with Miss Whitehead, which would have been like so fabulous. But um, it was, I was her colleague for, for several years. And I think that was very meaningful to her. And it was certainly meaningful to me. It was amazing. Wow. Um, from the book, we can tell that you are really well read and you have a mind for titles and details. Um, just thinking about the, you know, your experience growing up and then the interviews that you did, what author interview added the most books to your to read pile? Oh. And what were you most excited to discover? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we decided to do was take out from each interview um, a list of about 10 books that the author highly recommended. And, and we have that list at the end of, of every interview so that if you love a particular writer like Jennifer Egan, for example, um, you'll probably want to, well, it would be natural, it seems to me, to want to read the, the books that she talks about how much she loves. Um, I think the author who's, who, who's really added to my to be read list was Leila Lalami. And Leila Lalami is um, a Moroccan American writer. And the interview with her is, was just fascinating because she grew up in Morocco and Morocco at the time was a colonial, um, France was, uh, Morocco was one of France's colonies. And so I learned so much about that particular political issue, um, but also the books that she mentioned were books that I had not read, um, books that maybe only recently have been translated and available to American readers. I have to say that Leila Lalami's first novel is called The Moor's Account, and it is just absolutely wonderful. It is just an amazing novel based on a, re a, a, a historical novel based on a real person and she drew heavily on his um, diary, on his journals, uh, or on stories about him, I guess. Um, so I, 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 that's one list that I think is really Wow, and that's exciting that you mentioned Leila Lamy because she's actually going to be doing a club book with us on October 6th. Oh. So, yeah, so you'll oh. have to watch her. Yes, definitely. She's, she's just, she's, we interviewed her in her apartment um, in her home in Santa Monica and we sat in the living room. She had little goodies put out for us and you know, we could look at all the books and, um, and, and, and say, oh, I love that book. Oh, I'm not familiar with that book, which is what we did with most of the authors. Oh, so yeah. you, everybody must, 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 must turn in, uh, turn in for, for Layla's presentation. You will love her. Yeah, I, and in, the, in your book, I really liked the, the collection of books to read. I found myself like, I read it on my iPad and highlighting, oh, I need to read this, I need to read this. And at the end I go, which ones did I miss? Right. So, so many great books to discover. Yeah. Um, so on the topic of discovering books, on Twitter you share a lot of backlist titles. So I'm sure you have many answers to this question, but is there a writer or book you would love to see rediscovered? Oh, there are hundreds, <laughs> thousands of books that I would like to see um, rediscovered. Um, I guess really too many. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I do focus on in, in Twitter every day uh, on just talking about one backlist title of the day. And many of those are out of print. Um, some of them are in print, but you know they're not in the new book section of the library or the bookstore, so people are not finding them as as mm -hmm. easy as uh, to to find them is not often easy. Um, mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I don't know. There's just so many of them, and now of course that I say that nothing is coming into my head. 
Well, that's just fine. Um, if you think of something, let us know or write another book and we'll read it. Uh, so um, I have a question from the, the Facebook audience. Okay. Um, which of these authors surprised you the most? Did anyone have a presence or foibles that their avid readers would never have guessed? Um, you know, I, I, I have a TV show in Seattle that I've been doing since 2004 called Book Lust with Nancy Pearl. And once a month I interview an author. Uh, and I, and I, can, I can say that over those many years, there have been some authors that I've interviewed that I, as a result of having interviewed them, I would never read their books again. You know, oh, that there was wow. some foible or something, some, you know, egotism that I just could not, that I ended up not feeling that I really ever wanted to, I didn't care about that author anymore. Um, and I was, and I think that's always a problem that can happen because all of these authors in the writer's library are authors that I really was interested in and I really loved. And I have to say that when we finished, when Jeff and I finished all the interviews, I ended up liking these authors even more than I had at the beginning, you know, even more than I had going in. Um, so um, one of the things that, uh, one of the authors that we interviewed that, that you mentioned, Stacy, was Amor Tolls. And we interviewed him at his home in New York. And um, one of the things, for, Amor Tolls is a fabulous speaker. I have to say, he's somebody else. If you ever want, you know, if you need a, you know, if you, if you have a chance to hear him speak, go hear him. He speaks in just beautifully formulated paragraphs. And, you know, you know why the gentleman from Moscow is so well written because, you know, he's a perfectionist. Well, he is a real, real, real reader. And um, when we talked to him, I, I had just finished reading all of the Nero Wolf mysteries by Rex Stout in publication order. You know, I had all I had read them many times over the years, but this time I started at the beginning and read them in publication order. And he said, oh, Amor said, oh, that's what I like to do, too. I like to read books, you know, read an author's works in publication order. So that was really interesting because you always think, oh, your little, you know, readerly ticks are nobody is going to share that. Um, I, I, I was so, um, I was so moved by um, by something, talking to Madeline Miller, Madeline Miller, the author of Song of Achilles and Circe, wonderful retellings of the Iliad and the Odyssey, parts of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and justifiably award-winning, both of them. Um, but I, she, she grew up the daughter of um, an early feminist who had all of, you know, Germaine Greer and all of those early feminist books. And she and Madeline read all those books. So one of the discussions that we got into was a discussion about um, John Updike and John, uh, particularly John Updike's uh, view of women, and particularly the witches of Eastwick, which I could not stand, and it turned out that Madeline couldn't stand it. But <laughs> but when we tried to, when I tried to explain why I couldn't stand it, it was not a particularly coherent explanation. But when Madeline explained why she didn't like it, which is part of the interview in the book, it all made perfect sense. So each of the authors had their own. You know, um, Jennifer Egan, for example, Jenny Egan um, arranges her books. We saw where her, you know, we saw her books and she arranges her books, not in alphabetical order by author, not by color. She arranges her books by the book that she was working on, that she was writing when she read those books. Oh, and wow. so... Isn't that interesting? So all the books that she was reading in um, uh, Goon Squad, Letter from the Goon Love Squad. that title. Yeah, right. We're all together. Um, Look at Me, which was her, a book that Jeff and I both loved. All those books were in one place. And so um, the new book that she's starting to think about um, is set in the 18th century 
um, a little bit earlier than, um, well, so, so one of the authors that she would be interested in is um, uh, uh, Anthony Trollope's mother who took a trip through the United States and wrote a journal about it. So those books are all in a particular place too. <laughs> Wow, and not many people could make that decision to organize their book. I know. But, uh, but fun. I so know. another question from the Facebook crowd. Um, what tips do you have for procuring rare and perhaps out of print titles? The library is one thing, but <laughs> right. what would you say? I, yeah. um, so, so procuring, I'm going to um, take as buying and owning for yourself. So the library would not be part of that. Um, you know, um, Abe Books is um, a company that for a long time uh, is, a, is a good way of finding um, rare and out of print books. Now, I am not a book collector at all. Um, the books that I save are the books that I, that I can't bear not to have on my bookshelves. And many of them, everybody would laugh at because they're teenage books from when I was a teenager that I <laughs> love. Jeff Schwager uh, is a book collector. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to forward that information, uh, you know, forward that question to him and, and let him answer it. The, the, the book collector, most of the writers in, in this book, I think book collecting only came out uh, came up a couple of times, but the person, the uh, the writer who is a book collector, a true book collector, is Jonathan Lethem, and and he has been a book collector since he was a very young man. And all of those used bookstores in New York, where he grew up on Fourth oh, Avenue, wow. I think, um, really uh, um, gave him that start. Mm -hmm. So, when we were. Um... There are a few authors that you interviewed that I felt an immediate connection to, reading connection to, and Madeline Miller was one of them. Who did you find the most connection to? Oh, um, I, I, I think Russell Banks in a funny way. Um, Russell Banks was the first author that we brought to Seattle for the If All Seattle for the very first If All Seattle read the same book program now called very smartly Seattle Reads. I don't know why we didn't think of that, but Seattle Reads is the way they're uh, designating it now. And um, the book that we picked was Russell Banks's book, The Sweet Hereafter. And I hadn't seen him. That was back in 1998. And I hadn't seen him or talked to him um, in all that time since. Um, so going to meet him at his house uh, in Saratoga Springs and kind of renewing this friendship that we had developed um, and hearing him talk about what a troublemaking kid he was and that he was really you know, the bane of every teacher that he ever had. And, you know, I was somebody who, if the teacher said, you know, the next person who talks is going to have to stand in the corner. I was always the next person who talked out of turn. <laughs> that was me. So, you know, I could identify with Russell about that. But in Russell's interview, he talks about the, his fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Doherty, and how she, you know, how she dealt with this really, this really trouble, troublesome, I would say, unhappy child, um, again, through not, she didn't want him in, his, in the classroom, so she had the janitor take a big piece of plywood and put it on these, um, put it up on what are they called those horses or you know put it up on whatever so and 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 said and she said to russell now you don't ever have to come into class but i want you to do a three-dimensional map of brazil that shows us everything about brazil and, and he did and then russell told this wonderful story about nelson algren the man the, the person who wrote the man with the golden arm and being at the bread loaf writers conference in the 50s and um, when John Shardy was the head of it, and it was just fabulous. 
So one of my questions, which was also in the Facebook feed, um, which was I'm excited to see, says, I'm sorry if Miss Pearl gets this every night, but I'm hungry for more. Is it possible you and Jeff will do a sequel collection? So thank you very much. Thank you. And no matter how often the, that question is asked, it's always a pleasure to hear that question. Um, Jeff and I have been talking about doing an, a sequel to this book. Uh, both of us would like to, well, we would like to include, I would like to include more poets. We only have one poet in this book, Jane Hirschfield, and it's one of the best interviews in the book. It's fabulous. <clears throat> and we'd like to include some nonfiction writers as well. The trouble is that I don't want to do it as a series of Zoom interviews. I think that what's so important about this book and and you know i think i said this at the beginning what we hear is that is that the readers feel like they're with us as we're sitting with these writers and talking about books so that's a little bit of a stumbling block um you know if if it were up to jeff he would want us to he does want us to do zoom interviews but but I'm feeling pretty strongly, and my agent is our agent is feeling pretty strongly that 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 would not be a good idea. So we're at the stage where we're we're coming up with authors um, as though we were going to do another book, as though travel will be possible, and we can we can do another book. So it looks like I, we have a. It looks like we have a bunch of readers who are ready for that sequel, <laughs> but we will wait patiently. <laughs> so um speaking of poets though um what poets living or dead do you enjoy the most oh i i love i love katha pollitt p-o-l-l-i-t-t -T. um philip larkin is one of my favorite poets um uh a.e hausman is one of my favorite poets um usually as with books why it's so hard for me to pick a favorite writer is that usually it's a particular book or in this case a particular poem uh, jane hirschfield who we did interview um i love her poetry and her poetry just shines with her um intelligence and her her buddhist beliefs um so if you're unfamiliar with with jane she would be somebody I think that you would, that readers need to get to know better. Okay, yeah. So we did have a question about um, what, what are those teenage books that you have? <laughs> a few of those titles that you, um, yeah, right. that you're stuck with. Yes, it's very embarrassing. Um, but, you know, one of the questions that we asked the writers is, um, was there, was there were there books that really influenced who you are as a writer and i have to say that um there was a writer there was a writer named mary stoltz s-t-o-l-z and she wrote both teenage novels and she wrote novels for younger kids and a few of her books were newberry honor books for the ones for younger kids i don't i didn't the ones for younger kids didn't i didn't I don't know, they were fine, whatever. But the teenage novels meant so much to me. She wrote in a kind of, believe it or not, stream of consciousness kind of style. And though, and I'm gonna recommend two of her books if you can find them. Um, one is called In a Mirror and the other is called Second Nature. But um, she also wrote a book for kids called Cat in a Mirror, but ignore that. And just, <laughs> you know, do In a Mirror is such a wonderful teenage book. So over the years, I have found many of Mary Stoltz's books at garage sales and or library, library sales, particularly. So they're not in, they're in terrible condition, but I just love them. And I did reread In a Mirror because I thought, that that book needed to be i would love to see that book reissued but so what reading those books did for me when i was a teenager when i was a teenager 
um, really up until my 30s, I wrote poetry and I really considered myself that that's what I, I was. I was, I was somebody you know, who wrote poetry. And, and then in my 30s, all those poems started coming as prose. You know, a line would come into my head and it would be clearly prose. So I, it's been a long time since I wrote poetry. But the fiction that I, that I love to read and, and certainly my sort of unexpected novel, George and Lizzie, really, it, it, they're nothing like the um, Mary Stoltz books in subject or even in style. But Mary Stoltz showed me how, Mary, what, what reading Mary Stoltz did for me was um, reiterate in my sort of being how important interesting characters are, three-dimensional characters, and absolutely wonderful writing. And that's what Mary Stoltz had for me. So Mary Stoltz is, is you know, the best of my, of my teenage books. But I also have um, the Beanie Malone books by Lenora Mattingly Weber. Those are in print. You can get those. Um, um, all of the Rosamond Dujardin books. Oh, my gosh, those were so good. And Betty Cavana. Betty Cavana's teenage books, Spring Comes Riding, Going on 16, um, <laughs> The Boy Next Door, Angel on Skis, all of those books. I have, I, I have those. They have never been reprinted. Um, I would love to see them reprinted, although, you know, they're, I can't imagine teens reading them now. Really, mm -hmm. they're just so dated um, in their attitudes. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> <laughs> but I love them. <laughs> I love them so much. So. We have a question in regards to the community read program. So did you expect it to get so big after what you did in Seattle? And um, are there any national programs built on your original model that you are proud of and hold up would hold up as an example? Um, I, I didn't, I, certainly we didn't expect that that um, that the program would be replicated in in so many places, both in the United States and abroad. Um, I was I was lucky enough to be invited to come to Bosnia um, about six years ago. Um, the American Embassy, one of the cultural attaches at the American Embassy, had this wonderful idea um, uh, of getting all of Bosnia's teenagers from the the three different ethnic groups who who never come together but getting them all to read a particular book and then setting up discussion groups and then bringing some kids together in um in sarajevo and so i was there to teach people how to lead discussions um about difficult topics because there, it was it was new to everybody, um, and I'm I'm that was being there and watching these kids, um, Muslim kids sitting together with Croat kids sitting together with Serbian kids in a country that is um, basically set up to fail by the Dayton Accords. Um, I was so moving. It, I felt like if I had been younger when I went, I, it would have it would have changed my life. I would have gone in some some a different sort of direction. Um, so that really that was so meaningful um, to me to see that. But I think what's the best the best thing about the our early Seattle Reads program is that it's infinitely adjustable. It's infinitely usable no matter what size the community is, no matter how much money a community has to spend on it. You know, we wanted to bring the author um, to, to Seattle, uh, but you don't need the author coming to Seattle, you know, we uh, coming to your, your town. Um, you know, we wanted to, to, I felt very strongly that we wanted books that weren't bestsellers. We wanted books that would get people to read, again, older titles that were wonderful for book discussions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are many, many places that do talk about bestsellers, and that's, that's great. Um, 
I think what the um, the NEA does with the big read or the NEH or NEA, I guess, does with the big read um, is uh, is pretty exciting as well. Wow, what a wonderful experience. We have a lot of um, big one book programs. We had a great one over the summer with St. Paul Public Library friends. So just what, a great program. What, what book did you do? So the first one was Kate D. Camillo because of Win Dixie. Uh -huh. And the second one was, oh, I just blanked on the title. Uh, good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota. Okay. I see that. So. Oh, yeah, good. I love those sound. I loved because of Win Dixie, and I love Kate D. Camilla, and she's a Minnesotan, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she's fabulous. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about. There was a question in here about George and Lizzie. Mm -hmm. So what what sparked your interest in picking up the pen and writing some fiction yourself? Yeah, that was really a shock um, in a way. Um, so I, I had had foot, here's how it all happened. I had had foot surgery and very early in the morning and the doctor, when I was leaving, gave me a prescription for um, hydrocodone, oxycodone. And, you know, I, so I, I took an oxycodone before I left the hospital. It was done as an outpatient. And then the doctor said, take one every four hours for pain. So I took an oxycodone every four hours for pain. And um, that evening, as my husband helped me up the stairs, uh, because he was afraid I would fall over backwards, I turned to him and I said, this has been the best day of my life. And that night, I was lying in bed thinking about what a wonderful day it had been and why couldn't every day not be as wonderful as this day had been and these two characters came into my head and one and i knew that one was named george and the other was named lizzie and there they were in my head i knew at that moment where they met at a bowling alley in ann arbor and that's all i knew about them and they never left my head. And so from that day, that night, I just kept thinking about them. And at night, I would, to put myself to sleep, it, first of all, George and Lizzie is not autobiographical. Lizzie and I do share some things in common, like a tendency to um, uh, not be able to fall asleep. So to put myself to sleep, I would tell myself stories about George and Lizzie. And this went on for, you know, a number of years, I, I wouldn't, I wasn't writing anything down. I would just tell myself these stories. And I gradually got to know, I would say almost everything about this couple, George and Lizzie, um, from the moment they met to the end of the book. Um, and then one day, and this always happens with I think it happens with a lot of us readers. We get to a point, we get to a day where we can't find anything that meets that need that we have to read something. You know how we, you pull a book off the shelf and you look at it and you say, oh, I'm not, I'm just not in the right mood for that. You know, there's nothing that matches up. And there was nothing that matched up. I couldn't find anything to read. And I just, you know, get in this terrible state and grumble all the time. And then it occurred to me that I had this whole book in my head. You know, I had a book that I loved. I loved these characters. It was, it, you know, it was exactly, you know, it was a character driven book in my head. I thought I could write it well enough to please myself. And so that day I sat down and I typed what is the first sentence of, of the book um, that they met at a bowling alley, or that I think it gives the name of the bowling alley in Washtenaw, Michigan. Um, and, and then just started almost like taking dictation from my head because all those stories about them were there. Oh, wow. So that's how, that's how George and Lizzie happened. And I have to say, I think it probably will be the only novel that I ever write, but, um, and I, and I, you know, I wrote it for me. I wrote it because I wanted something to read. And I think in the end that that's, that 
that if you write for somebody else, if you write for your agent or you write with the hope that it's gonna get published or that it's gonna be option for a film, that that's, that that's paralyzing. But if you write for yourself, if you write the kind of book that you would like to read, I think that's the way to write a good book. Oh. <laughs> and that's so there fun. Right there. Yeah, I, um, I'm excited to read it. I've been reading the Writer's Library. Yeah. This will be my next title. Yes. Um, well, yeah. keep in mind, Stacy. it is not autobiographical. <laughs> I will keep, keep that in mind. Yeah, I won't do. picture <laughs> you as Lizzie. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a question. Um, a question from Facebook. What is the story of the action figure? So oh. how did that come about? So that came about um, in, in a lovely sort of way. So um, my, there's, a, t there's a, a store in Seattle called Archie McPhee, which if we can ever travel again and you happen to come to Seattle, you must go to Archie McPhee because they have all sorts of really interesting, kitschy, funny things. Like, and, and they, they had done um, a series of action figures already, like they did Shakespeare, I think. And, um, I, and they have a wonderful website too. So you can, you can get stuff from them. So my husband and I were at a, at a dinner party with the owner of Archie McPhee. And, um, and he was telling us that one of the action figures was a Jesus action figure. And he was telling us that people were writing in, writing to him and saying that actually the Jesus action figure was really performing miracles for them. Um, and so we all, you know, um, nodded, like you're nodding, Stacey. Well, that's very interesting. And I said, but Mark, the people who really perform miracles every single day, who really change people's lives, are librarians. And somebody said, oh, Mark, you should do a librarian action figure. And then someone else said, and Nancy should be the model for it. Well, you know, the conversation went on to other things. And, you know, I certainly didn't think anything would ever come of it. When my husband and I were driving home that night, and this will tell you all you need to know about my marriage, all that's important about my, my long, long, long marriage. My husband said, um, Nancy, do you really, um, let, do you really want to be a five inch non biodegradable plastic thing? And I said, well, it will, and this is me always, well, it will never happen. And then he said his, his favorite words to me, and I know many husbands have, you know, their own favorite words that, that their wives hear again and again. My husband's favorite words, four words, a, a sentence of four words. He said, Nancy, think this through. So that, so, and then nothing happened and nothing happened and nothing happened. And then on, actually on April 1st of the next year, Mark called and said, would I come to Muckleteo, which is a town north of Seattle, where their headquarters are, would I come to Muckleteo to be digitized? <laughs> now, I'm never going to write a memoir, you know, um, um, my books about books are my memoirs, I think. But if I was ever going to write a memoir, that would be the first line. I went to Muckle Teo to be digitized. Um, so a great I, first line. I, I know. So I was digitized. <laughs> I um, how does one become digitized? Well, one stand, it's very easy. One stands on a, on a, um, a, a like a circular thing that turns very, very, very slowly. And there's pictures that are taken in that whole, at least that's how I became digitized. Now, you know, one of the complaints about the librarian action figure is that she looks dowdy, you know, but I have to say in real life, those were very pretty clothes as I, <laughs> I have to say they were from Eileen Fisher. So they were expensive clothes. Um, the most expensive clothes I've ever had. Um, and, but they don't translate well. That classic, you know, that classic sort of Eileen Fisher doesn't translate well to plastic. But who was I going to ask? 
for advice. There was nobody. I couldn't ask Shakespeare. I couldn't ask Jane Austen. I mean, at that time, I was the only living action figure, and I had to choose my own clothes. So the brand new action figure, which is really a superhero action figure, um, I, the action figure is wearing jeans and a sweater and has a cape. Mm. So this, this action figure is truly a superhero. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, since we talked about a couple origin stories with the action figure and George and Lizzie, how about Booklust? How did Booklust come to be called Booklust? Um, yeah, so it came to be called Booklust because um, my editor for that book, a man named Gary Luke, and I um, were trying to think of a title for the book, and we couldn't think of a title. And then Gary had the idea of calling it book lust, recommended books for every mood, moment, and reason. And I thought book lust was a fabulous title because that's what I have as a lust for reading. Um, we loved that title. And then when the book was finished and we, um, I guess Gary had to announce, or he had to announce that the book was coming to the salespeople um, from the company that that distributed would distribute it, sell and distribute the book. The salespeople did not like the name Booklust. They, they, in fact, did not think it was a good title at all. And so Gary called and said, you know, come into the office. We've got to think of another title. And so we spent eight hours trying to come up with other another title that we liked as well or nearly as well. And we couldn't come up with anything. And finally, Gary said, we're just going with book lust and and we did now i have to say the the sequel to book lust is, is okay so when when book lust did so well and people loved it um gary said what about doing a sequel to book lust we can call it book lust to the morning after which I thought was the funniest thing ever. And I really, really wanted to call it that. But then in the end, Gary just like flinched and he said, no, 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 we'll just call it more book lust, which is so boring, you know. I have said this to him numerous times and uh, you know, he knows how I feel about it. But book lust to the morning after would have been brilliant. <laughs> so I'd love to tie us back, um, bring us back around to Writer's Library. Okay. Um, so we had a question about how long did it take to put together the, to put, bring it from concept to publication? And how was it hard to schedule people? Yeah, um, uh, it did, it took, last year at this time was when we were doing the interviews. It's, that's when we were flying around the country. Uh, doing the interviews. It was, um, it, it, because there were the writers on the East Coast that we wanted to interview, writers from um, New York up to Maine, we interviewed Richard Ford in Maine, um, we, we, we wanted to get them on a, you know, so we just would have to make one trip. I mean, living in mm -hmm. Seattle is fabulous, but but getting out of Seattle takes a, a day to get anywhere. And it's not like Minneapolis where, you know, where you guys live, where it's so easy to, to just hop on a plane and get to New York or Detroit or whatever. Um, um, so uh, luckily that East Coast trip worked out great. And there, we had one, one author that we had to cancel because um, there was a huge um, thunderstorm that we couldn't get out of wherever we were going or uh, the, uh, getting out of Portland, Maine, I think is where we couldn't get out of. And so there was, there was that whole issue. But we had to make a couple trips to, to the West Coast, um, to San Francisco, because um, when we were supposed to interview Michael Shabon and I yell at Waldman, um, their uh, Michael's father unexpectedly died so you know we had to put that off but you know um that that was that was only to be expected I think you know that 
you know, we did the best we could. We flew separately to Minneapolis because we wanted to interview Louise Erdrich. And, and that was very important to both me and Jeff that we do that, um, that we include her in the book. And her interview is, is just so interesting because, you know, when she was a little girl, the book she really wanted to read was Marjorie Morningstar by <laughs> Herman Woke. And it was way, way up in her parents' bookshelf. And, you know, she would have to climb on things to, to get that book. Um, and then, um, and we taped all the interviews, um, not taped, di digitally recorded all the interviews, and then took them back. Uh, we, you know, we came back to Seattle, and then we started transcribing the interviews ourselves. And then that's where I personally hit a wall, because to transcribe an interview that was like an hour and a half long, that's a long, I mean, that's a long interview and I just could not do it. I mean, I just like, no, I, there wouldn't be a book if you were still waiting for me to, to transcribe these interviews. And so luckily I was interviewing for my TV show, another writer, uh, a, a Seattle writer named Erica Bauermeister. And I was telling her how much trouble I was having doing the transcriptions. And she said, oh, my son's girlfriend might be interested in that. She works at Finney Books and she loves to read. Uh, and so um, uh, Annika Miller did all the transcriptions, thank God. And um, then Jeff and I would get them and we would then have to cut, painfully cut them down to a reasonable length. Uh, and then we sent the interviews back to the authors uh, the edited interviews back and they had the freedom to do whatever they wanted with them. And so, uh, and then we got them back. Oh, wow. So we're actually getting several questions about Nancy's rule of 50. Yes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how that came about. So the rule of 50, um, I, I always get these I, I used to do, I used to be on um, the uh, local public radio station uh, uh, weekly here, and we would do the show live, and we would take phone calls. And the, the question that I would most often get is, you know, um, how long should I read a book that, I, that I'm not enjoying? And so one day, you know, just came out of my mouth, I said, you know, give a book 50 pages, and then if you're not enjoying it, stop reading it. You know, put it on the shelf, your bookshelf, return it to the library, lend it to somebody. If you don't like a book, you know, 90% of why we don't like a book or like a book, it has to do with our moods. It has to do with where we are in our lives. And if you don't like a book today, in six weeks, you might love that book. It, it just so, so much depends on what mood you're in. So I said, so give a book 50 pages. If at the end of 50 pages, all you care about is who done it or who marries whom, then turn to the last page, you know? Um, you know, our government knows lots about us and can find out lots about us, but thus far, they can't tell if we finished a library book all the way to the end. So, you know, I said, just look at the last page and then skip the in-between if that's all you care about. Um, it, you know, life is too short to slog your way through a book that you're not enjoying, even if it's a classic, even if it's a Pulitzer Prize winner, if you're not enjoying it, it's not a good book at that moment for you. That's all that that means. And so my rule of 50 um, was very useful. You know, I said it almost as a joke. It was just like a throwaway thing that just came into my head. And people, you know, people like, they didn't like it or they loved it, but they took it much more seriously, like it was Moses, you know, like I was presenting <laughs> the Ten Commandments. And it worked really well for me. I mean, I lived by that um, thing. And then after, after the age of 50, like 51 and up, then time goes by much faster you know, and you have, a, a, we have a finite number of years to live, whatever that number for each individual person is. So when you're, oh, when you're 51 and up, what I said was that you should read 
you should subtract your age from 100. And that number, which gets smaller every year, is the number of pages that you should read before you give up on a book. Now, what that means is that when you turn 100, you can legitimately judge a book by its cover. So that, so, so that, that is the, uh, the rule of 50. Now, I feel like now, the minute that I stop enjoying a book, no matter what page it is, um, or that I'm annoyed by an authorial tick or something, I, um, I just stop reading that book, knowing, knowing all the time that you can go back to it. You can always try it again. It's not like you're, you know, getting rid of this book forever. You can always go back and try it again. Wow. So that's the rule of 50. Wonderful. We had one final question I want to add. Any, okay. any advice to the librarians out there? You know, um, my advice, what I would like to say is that you are really in the best profession ever. And you are really making a difference in this world. And you're helping people find the information that they need to live a more fulfilling or a better life is um, something that nobody else can do the way librarians do it. I would also say that don't give up on what we call in the library world reader's advisory and what booksellers call hand selling. That it's really, when you find the right book for somebody, when you engage in a conversation about books in the public library, what a great good you are doing whether or not the particular book meets their, their needs or not, but the, that the public library is the heart of the community. It is the heart and soul of its community. And to lose that is to lose our democracy. I honestly believe that. So librarians, you are, you are at the heart of the world. Oh. Thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you for all you do and all your writing and all your sharing about the power of reading. Thank you. So that's all we have for this evening. Thanks again, Nancy, for penciling us into your busy September. And congratulations on the success of the Writer's Library, which debuted just a few weeks ago. Don't forget to order your own copy of the Writer's Library from Red Balloon Bookshop and to request your personalized signed book plate from Nancy. This has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Before you log off, look for the Club Book survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. Last, consider joining Club Book next Wednesday the 30th for a talk with award-winning journalist and climate advocate, Dar Jamail. They will be right here on Facebook Live. This one will be co-hosted and facilitated by St. Paul Public Library. And as always, it's free. Have a great night, everyone, and thank you.